Hey, welcome everyone to the Legends of Sport podcast and the next episode of our Restarting the Clock series. I'm your host, Andy Bernstein, and I'm reporting to you from the NBA bubble in Orlando. I recorded today's podcast just before I left LA with NBA veteran and broadcaster Corey Maggetti. Corey was recruited by Coach K at Duke, who told us, quote, Corey was one of the best athletes we have had in my 40 years of coaching at Duke. He was our first one and done and helped us reach the national championship game. I had the pleasure of photographing Corey throughout his 14-year NBA career, most notably his eight years spent with the LA Clippers. Corey was a dynamic player and very active off the court. We talk about how involved he's been in the community since the start of his career and continues to be. We also talk about his transition to broadcasting and the generous mentoring of his Hall of Fame partner, Ralph Lawler, another friend of the LOS podcast. Corey also shares a couple of personal stories of the great Kobe Bryant, both of which I hadn't heard before, so I hope you're gonna enjoy those. Great to catch up with a Clippers legend as the team progresses through the NBA playoffs in the bubble. Enjoy this conversation with Corey Maggetti, and as always, I'll see you on the backside. Well, welcome, Corey Maggetti, uh, to, to the Legends of Sport podcast. It is the first interview I've done with somebody in the car, so that's kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. How you doing, man? I'm doing good, Andy. How are you? I'm good. I'm hanging in. You know, it's good to have hoops back. Um, I'm going down there in a couple of weeks, and uh, I don't know what I'm in for, but we'll have to see what's going on. <laughs> Well, I tell you what, they, they, you know, they definitely can't wait to get a lot of your your wonderful pictures that you've 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 shown the entire NBA and people across the entire world, you know, for decades and decades. So. Well, thank you, man. That includes you too, my friend. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, Corey, let's get right into this, man. Um, a few major things I want to cover with you. I want to start off almost at the beginning. All right. So you're at Duke. You're playing for Coach K. Right, Elton Brand is your teammate, right? And you decide to come out after what your second year, right? First year, first, first year. year. That's right. Elton was second year, I think. Yeah, Elton and was second. So we, you know, I had Coach K on the podcast, uh, and I know him pretty well, and I know he's not a big fan of guys coming out early, right? So what was that conversation like? Well, uh, you know what, you know, a lot of the perception is that Coach K just hated the, the idea and, and of course you know the the one thing about the Duke basketball program and just Duke in general is that they really wanted all of their players to to graduate and get their degree there mm -hmm. and that's something that even now I still value that and what they were trying to accomplish in this stance mm -hmm. um, before I made the decision to come out and honestly Andy you know I've told this story many times that you know me coming out wasn't that that wasn't the plan you know yeah. my plan was to stay there you know, the entire four years because I would have been basically the first first guy in my family, first to go to a prestigious university mm. uh, like Duke and to get my degree. And so that was number one on my radar. Yeah. Uh, as far as as far as coming out, you know, I think things just change. And, you know, for me, it was it was a, a decision that I had to make on my own. It had nothing to do with mm. my parents or anyone else. Mm -hmm. I consult with my parents and even through that process, I, I consulted with coach K, mm -hmm. you know, I actually went to coach K's home, uh, sat next to him. He actually had, had uh, hip surgery at the time. Oh, I remember so, that. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. So you know, he, he brought me there, had hip surgery and I had a conversation with coach K. He brought out all, you know, the data, uh, from publications to, to agents mm -hmm. in that time where I will be drafted. And he kind of gave me a plan. And even to, to the fact that, you know, Coach K was disappointed that I made the decision, but he said at the end of, end of the day, Corey, it's ultimately your decision on what you do. Am I happy with this decision? No, I'm not happy with it. Mm -hmm. But, of course, I'm going to wish you the best in your career. Yeah, yeah. Well, it turned out pretty good. <laughs> so, yeah. So I want to fast forward to, to your stint at the Clippers, right? And you were with the Clippers eight years with it, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, almost anchors, yeah. And you played with some characters there. I mean, I was going through the roster over those eight years. I'm gonna just list some. I'm gonna list some dudes' names here: Lamar, uh -oh. Robert, Darius yeah. Miles, Quentin Richardson, the Caveman himself, <laughs> right? Caveman, Chris Caveman, Chris Caveman. Yeah. Tito Mobley, Sam Cassell, Matt Barnes. I mean, I could go on and on. I mean, yeah. what a what a group of characters, right? 
<laughs> well, you know what, man? I, I got to say about every one of those those players, man. They they are good friends of mine still to this day. Yeah. And uh, good relationships with them. I, I think far as what we had, and you know, Andy, because you mm -hmm. you you know you were there at, at our games, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it was an interesting thing. We had so much talent. We had a lot of talented individuals, like you say, from the standpoint of characters. Mm -hmm. Everyone had their own identity until we got Sam Cassell and Catino Mobley and the way Elton Brand took off and how Cayman was able to kind of change his, his game be more mature in the standpoint was the real valid way when we actually made the playoffs mm -hmm. and we were a, a team that people like, wow, this Clipper team is a good team. And so, but through that the process of even, you know, uh, Darius Miles and Quentin Richardson, the guys that, you know, I, I would say kind of started the fact of it, people kind of took a liking to the Clippers mm -hmm. and Darius Miles really brought that excitement to our team. Mm -hmm. He brought, you know, this young kid out of high school mm -hmm. that, that was basically raw and had an unbelievable amount of talent and character. You know, Quentin Richardson, these are guys that I grew up with, Andy. Yeah. And Quentin yeah. Richardson that I played with ever since we were in, you know, sixth grade back at, you know, our church league to playing against each other, playing with each other, winning AAU Nationals mm -hmm. as an eighth grader. And then finally, once we retire, win a mm -hmm. big three championship. But those guys, man, I tell you, man, they were they were the ones that kind of sparked, you know, the notice, basically the recognition for the Clippers at that time. Yeah, for sure. Well, is it safe to say that 2005-06 was your favorite season? I mean, it was a season you made the playoffs. You guys finished second in, in the Pacific Division, right? You were sixth spot. The Lakers were in the seventh, I think, right? So that was a great year. Well, you know what? I would say far as from a playoff standpoint and the recognition that our team – got during that time because we worked so hard to get to that position you know ultimately i would say every year that i i, I played in the nba was a good year for me mm -hmm. i loved it it was mm -hmm. one of i would say my best times because you know a kid from in chicago mm -hmm. illinois getting the opportunity to play in the nba first of all getting the opportunity to go to duke university then playing in the nba for almost 15 years it was a truly a blessing for me every single time i stepped on the floor Mm. Even though the adversity, you know, of our team losing, you know, constant games, you know, it, it, I still had that that passion and that desire, you know, that I wanted to be the best player. I mm. wanted to, you know, try to succeed at some way. Uh, so I, I consider every single season a blessing. You know, it's interesting because you, you I'm just thinking about the dates here and you played for the Clippers when the Lakers – were good <laughs> then the lakers yeah. went down and you guys came up right yeah. and then uh you had this historic game against kobe when was it 2007 you, kobe and the lakers not just kobe but in 2007 you had that your career high of 39 again and uh, what was that like what, did the mamba talk some trash during that game <laughs> well, i'm gonna tell you i had a few incidents with, with kobe and this is how we became good friends and the relationship of us, us having the same agent and it started back you know early on when I was coming off the bench and this was a game that was on TNT when I finally got an opportunity to kind of really play and I think I scored 29 points but I had scored like 18 in the quarter and it was on Kobe yeah. and so I remember the conversation with Kobe we were going back and forth talking trash and uh after the game you know I got a I got a text message from from him say hey you know, I, I, I love the way you competed, mm. you know, tonight. And that was like the ultimate respect. And from that, from that time, we end up building a relationship, you know, that, you know, was standing until he passed away. And so um, for me, he was one of the guys that you, you modeled your game after a lot of players in the NBA, but I had, I had a really great connection because, you know, I knew this guy, we were the first two clients, you know, of Rob Palenka when he started, uh, landmark sports so you know we had we had a, a special bond when it came to that factor and then when he retired from the game of basketball we had another passion because we really we really admired the youth and from that standpoint I was already retired for three or four years mm -hmm. and I started more of more basketball camps out in Orange County where we lived down the street from each other mm -hmm. and and from that standpoint he saw like hey Corey you're doing a lot of things as far as what 
with girls basketball. He's doing a lot of stuff for, for, for boys basketball. Mm-hmm. And, and he would show up at, at our basketball events, not only just to be there, but to talk to the kids for me. And, and from, that, from that standpoint, he, he's always been a visionary. And to see like, hey, you know, this is what he wanted to do for his, his daughter Gianna. Because Gianna would come to our, to our basketball camps and work out and train and with the boys and girls. So, you know, to see what he had built during that time, because he was, like I said, he was more of a visionary and looking ahead on how not only he can be a great dad and what he can do for his community out there. Wow. That's a great, great story. And I didn't, I didn't know anything about that, about, I knew about your camps, but I didn't know that, that he showed up and Gigi was part of that. It's amazing. But I got to hear about something that my researcher producer Veronica uncovered, which I know you've talked about before, but I got to hear about this shark story. <laughs> I, mean, I got to hear it from you. What is the deal with that? That, that just tell the story if you could. <laughs> so, so listen, man, I, I get a, I get a call from Rob Palinga and Rob is saying, Hey man, I want to, you know, do you want to meet me and Kobe? We're, we're out. We're in the ocean. We're going to, you know, swim with great white sharks. I'm like, what? Swim with great white sharks? So he said, I'm dead serious. So next thing you know, Rob puts me, puts me on FaceTime. He said, man, we're here. We're here with, in by the ocean. We're, we're about to get in the water. I said, man, you, you, you're lying, Rob. He said, Kobe is right here. We're about to get in there. So all of a sudden I see Kobe in there. Kobe said, man, I'm, we're about to swim with great white sharks. And for, for Kobe, this was a stance for him. And his motto was like, the reason I'm, I'm swimming with great white sharks, yeah. I want to have no fear. And when I play the game of basketball, whatever I do, I want to have no fear. And for me to have this, I'm going to swim with great white sharks. And I thought that this guy was out of his mind. And so... <laughs> So they're begging me, like, hey, Corey, you need to come. I'm like, listen, man, you guys are crazy. There's no way that you're getting me to come swim with great white sharks. Right. And, <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. So now Rob is off the phone. Rob's like, man, Corey, I am so scared. Like, I can't even believe Like, he, he wants me to swim in, in the ocean now with these great white sharks. And so, you know, this entire time Rob is talking to me, you know, he's scared out of his mind. But Rob ended up you know, happened to swim with, with great white shots because this was what Kobe, Kobe oh wanted to God. master, master the fear, the yeah. fear factor. Oh. And if I can do this, then there's no person that I would ever fear on a basketball court or in life. That dude was on another level. Not. He was on yeah. another level. I mean, I could just, I know Rob, as you do, I can just imagine him. He doesn't want to say no, but every fiber in his body is like, there's no chance of doing it. Exactly. I mean, Rob would never say no. Like, yeah. like uh, Rob, uh, Kobe, like, uh, Rob, I need you. I need you for this. Uh, yeah. We need to do this. And Rob would like, all right, all right, Kobe, all right, all right, whatever you say, let's, let's roll. So, you know, oh. they had such a special bond, and that was Rob's best friend, man. They had yeah. such a special bond. Yeah, no, I know, I know. Wow, I mean, there's probably a million stories you could tell about Kobe, but that one, that one is fantastic. What a great story. So, I got to tell, tell you one more story. Sure. So we, this was during the time when it was the lockout time. Hmm. Um, I, I think it was... 2011. It was yeah, like around around that time. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of players at that time was trying to, you know, kind of schedule more of like these games, right? Where you can have these big games while the NBA season is not going on. Mm-hmm. We can have basketball games and then you'll be able to pay pay some players to come. And so I'm in Denver, Colorado at this time and I'm with, you know, some investor investor friends of mine that were building like, all right, we're gonna we're gonna have this 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 area sanctioned for basketball NBA guys to come and play. Mm. So they like, hey Corey, do you think you could get Kobe? to come and play he said you know all right well at that time they had just got Kevin Durant said he had scheduled he was going to play so I call Kobe and I'm, I'm at a board table right so I have like you know these guys is worth you know four or five hundred million dollars right that's sitting around the table and I said all right well let me let me get him on get him on a horn so I call him and I'm talking I say hey Kobe I'm, I'm here with some investors and they want to know if you can play in one of the games and they want to know if you were charged, you know, it's a hundred thousand dollars or something to do this. 
And so I put Kobe on speaker and he's like, uh, 50, um, listen, if, if, if you want me to play, it's going to cost 500,000. Now, if, if you want the Mamba Cape to come out and play, it's going to cost you a cool million. <laughs> and, and so I literally turned my best friend, uh, Terrence Doyle at the time, I'm, I turned to him and all the investors is looking like, is, is he serious? <laughs> and, and I put the phone on mute and I'm like, oh man, I think it was a joke. And then I take it off mute and he said, Corey, by the way, I'm not joking. So if you want the Mamba Cape, it's going to be a cool million. <laughs> I, when I tell you, it, it had to be the, the funniest, funniest um, response that I've ever seen in my entire life. But oh, also, uh, also like an embarrassment too. Like, man, I'm sitting around these guys <laughs> and they're trying to, try to put some together and Kobe is asking for a million dollars to, to kind of do like almost like a charity game. So yeah, it was just a funny incident. That's hilarious. As you're telling me that it reminds me of when I used to shoot magic and, uh, and I'd ask him for a smile and he goes, you want the million dollar smile? You want the $2 million smile? <laughs> That's I would have been surprised if Kobe got there for magic. <laughs> Probably. So, Corey, I got to transition to your, your career as a broadcaster. And I love seeing you go from, from suiting up in the number 50 to being in a suit, you know, being courtside. And I, I have a, a quote from, from the great Ralph Lawler, who we both love dearly. Yes. And I, I'm going to read it just to embarrass you. But he says uh, about you, he says, Corey's just a lovely man. I enjoyed our time together when he played with the Clippers, but really came to appreciate what a quality individual he was as he entered our broadcast fraternity. He is a good Cullen commentator. He was a terrific player and he is even a better husband, father and friend. Joe and I love him to death. <laughs> How about wow. that? <laughs> you, you, you know what, Andy? I mean, I, I, I actually talked to Ralph um, before the Phoenix game the other day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was checking on to see how he was he was doing. And and when I tell you about a guy that, when I call a mentor in the broadcast in, uh, industry, but but more importantly, as, as a friend, you know, I look to Ralph as almost like my grandfather. My grandfather passed away, you know, almost seven years ago. Mm -hmm. and, and he kind of reminded me of, of Ralph. And, you know, he will hold you accountable. And, it, and even to the time when I'm, when I'm on air, if I'm saying things that, that might not be right, mm -hmm. or even to the fact of re really just trying to give me constructive criticism to, to prepare me. Mm -hmm. and, and I really admire that about Ralph. But he's the one that has given me more drive to, to be a better, a better analyst on TV. Mm -hmm. And it, it takes time. And, and it's to the point where, you know, Ralph said, hey, these are some people you need to talk to as far as mm -hmm. making sure that you're saying things right, making sure your verb tense, tense is right, making sure that you have all the information. And I admire that about Ralph to be able to not only step outside of himself to help me, but to put me in a position to be successful after the game of basketball. Mm -hmm. He would say, Corey, listen, forget about basketball right now. You're in career number two, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to prepare you to be the best broadcaster that you can be and this is how you can do it and so I, I really admire him for even taking those steps to help me be the a better analyst more importantly he, he was such a good friend mm. a person I can talk to like I said to this day I still talk to Ralph two days mm. ago I'm talking to Ralph yeah. checking on him seeing how how Joe uh, is doing so I, I really appreciated everything about Ralph yeah I mean it's such a such a unique individual somebody who've been in the game for so long but stayed humble kind of like your uncle you know <laughs> and yeah. you know i could see what it, what a great mentor he was to you and how much confidence it gave you to do what you do you know um i've had a couple of people like that in my life that it could have gone the other way you know it could have been yeah. intimidating you could have felt like you were stepping you know on his toes or whatever. but ralph was never like that man i, I love that yeah. And, and the thing about with, with Ralph, he had such another uh, uh, another counterpart in uh, Sarah Takata. Yeah, so Sarah Takata was yeah. was yeah. basically the one that kind of started me in the TV industry back when I was playing with the Clippers, uh -huh. doing like some of those uh, old Megadio show. Uh -huh. She kept prompting me to do things, and then all of a sudden, Ralph was the one that initiated 
to introduce me to Micah King at the time with Fox. So, mm, I mean, okay. from a collaboration standpoint, man, those, those two really have been uh value people for us in my, in my TV career. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's great. I know Sarah really well and she's top notch, man. Top shelf. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Hey, Corey, last thing I want to talk about is, um, is everything that you've done off the court since day one. Uh, mm -hmm. as a rookie, <laughs> maybe even college, I don't know, all of the initiatives you started, the camps, I don't want to ask you which one you're most proud of, but what, what's what been your philosophy of giving back? What, you know, why so involved? Well, well, first of all, I would say, you know, during, even over the last six years, I've been more of an advocate for Jesus Christ. And, um, and I just feel like for me in my life is being more of a server and being more of a servant. And so, you know, my family, we have really put in our mouth where our money is, basically, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we hear about so many people saying they want to donate, um, but we wanted to donate and also give our time. The most valuable thing on this earth is our time. And so a lot of times uh, I felt like giving my time and making sure that I can be available to those people was, was part of like our acts of service. And so, mm -hmm. you know, for me, you know, what really prompted me was more about how like my parents and my grandfather, who was a minister at the time, and he always, when I tell you, you know, he always served the community. Mm -hmm. you know, he served the com community. And, and even if he didn't have anything, he would give his last to someone else. Mm -hmm. And I really value that, that humility that, that he showed. And far as even to the fact that, you know, my my sister-in-law and, and, and my wife, they, they really were, were big advocates on giving back. And that's kind of prompted me to the fact of doing like basketball camps. This, you know, like you said, this started back after my second year mm -hmm. in the league. I started those free basketball camps in, in Chicago yeah. in Bellwood and Maywood. Mm -hmm. And I got the idea first from Michael Finley at the time. Michael Finley, a great friend of mine, a great mentor, a person that I looked up to, as well as Juwan Howard, you know, back then those guys really said, Hey, you know, why don't you start to do stuff for your community? And I'm mm. thinking like, hey, I'm just a young kid. You know, what do I know? But I, I, I kind of listened to those guys and and started doing those basketball camps. And, you know, we were doing three, 400 kids at a time. Mm. And I was paying for that stuff out of my pocket, mm. you know, and, and had my I had my entire family, all of my family in Chicago. I had them working. I gave them a chance to earn money. But more importantly, it was more about more about the kids in the community because I knew the, the impact that it had. Right. I knew how impactful for me going to the boys and girls clubs and going to play outside, you know, on the playground. And I wanted to give, you know, those kids a chance to to have a guy in their community that they say, hey, you know, we can make it out of this area. And that was one of the things even for Michael Finley. We, we really kind of collaborated on that stance on being you know, being able to go out and, and give these basketball camps, you know, even during this COVID time, you know, our family, we've gone to Mariners Church and donated more food and we've, we've been more hands on. And honestly, man, I think I've been blessed so, so much, Andy, you know, I, I wouldn't even feel right if I didn't give back. I think it's a part of my DNA, mm. you know, trying to be an advocate to give back to our communities, um, trying to be an advocate to to try to walk in character and integrity. Mm -hmm. And so that's been, that's kind of, that's been my motto uh, mm -hmm. this entire time. Yeah. I think the first time I met you was at um, a Clippers reading all-star event or something. The first year you were with the Clippers. I mean, I'd seen you on the court and we, you know, acknowledge each other, but then I, every CR event that went on, <laughs> I think you were at pretty much that the Clippers put on. It was pretty amazing. You were like a, I, gift, a gift to Denise Booth and her crowd, you know? <laughs> and I, was, I was just going to say that. I think Denise, Denise Booth and Tanisha at that time, Tanisha. When she was working for, right, for the Clippers. Right. She's now with the, with the Lakers. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I told them like, hey, you know, anything that you guys need from me that I can be involved in a community to help the kids, mm. you know, call just call me. And mm. I think the, the real thing about it is, like even those times when I felt like I didn't want to, or I was tired, or mm. it was a practice time, you know, even Denise Booth and Tanisha holding me accountable. Hey, Corey, this is what you said you wanted to do, mm -hmm. and I'm like, you know what? You know, instantly, you're right. You know, mm -hmm. and that's the that's what I really valued about, you know, even doing those Clippers event because mm -hmm. Denise and Tanisha really 
uh, held me held, held me accountable for those and pushed me to be more uh, more involved in the community. Right. And I would think that that rubbed off on the rest of the team. I mean, the other guys saw you doing that. You're one of the leaders on the team to begin with. But, you know, when you're putting yourself out there, you know, the guys can they take notice of that. So that's good for you, man. Hey, been so great talking to you, um, catching up. <laughs> I miss seeing you. I mean, you know, but we hopefully, hopefully soon, Andy, that we, you know, that everything would change and we we start to have more human interaction. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah. I, you know, but again, like it's, it's good to see the basketball. It's good to see basketball mm -hmm. give the entire world. If it's two hours and 45 minutes a time to think about something different. Yeah. And so, I mean, I really value what the NBA has, has done and the players really sacrificing, you know, their health to be there. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's been amazing to watch. Well, thank you, my friend. Uh, so great to catch up, and uh, we'll we'll you know we'll see each other some way. I'll wave to you from the bubble some some yeah, way. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do another uh, another interview inside of the car. So I'm in the car, you in the studio. That would be interesting. Or <laughs> I'll, I'll do it from quarantine once I get to Orlando. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Good to see you, man. Take care, Corey. Nice care, man. Okay. All right. See you. Bye bye. Well, big thanks to Corey McGetty for taking the time from his car <laughs> to speak with us. Really, really great chat. And uh, I love catching up with him. He's truly one of my favorite guys on and off the court. Thanks to Debbie Spander at Wasserman for her help. And as always, to my producer and researcher, Veronica Ahn, for keeping things running in LA as I'm deep in the bubble covering the NBA playoffs. As promised, we'll be bringing you new podcasts each week in our Restarting the Clock series while I'm on location in the bubble until mid-October. We have some really, really terrific guests coming up as we get closer to the NBA Finals and the conclusion of this unique NBA season. Please remember, you can find us on the LA Times app and online, as well as your favorite podcast platforms such as Apple and Spotify. We will be posting photos from my coverage of the NBA playoffs, so please check out all our platforms, Instagram, at Legends of Sport, Twitter, at Legends underscore of Sport, our blog is legendsofsport.blog, and our YouTube and TikTok channels, Legends of Sport. You can always see my photography on Instagram at ADB Photo Inc. Hey, stay well, stay safe, everyone, and don't forget, wear your mask. <laughs>